Hi. Um, so my name is Misha Benjamin. I'm legal counsel at Element AI. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Element AI is a Montreal-based, because we're still a startup, but a rapidly growing startup uh, in the AI field. Uh, we were started um, with a strong collaboration from uh, certain people at the uh, University of Montreal, and uh, we still have that strong collaboration. So uh, we have researchers that we share with uh, several universities here in Montreal, and that relationship is very important to us. It allows us to, um, one, to innovate, to have access to the latest innovations that are happening within universities, and it allows us to keep that talent somewhat in the university so that they keep evolving, driving research that we can then uh, come in and apply into uh, services. And I think because of that, uh, because of that link with the university, we have a, an interesting take on how open science initiatives can be translated into industry. Um, and obviously, uh, one of those elements is how we use and then recontribute open source software to uh, the community at large. So um, I definitely agree with, uh, with uh, Richard and I think everyone else here that open science is something that's very important. It drives innovation in a way that uh, little else can. It also allows um, you know, a certain democratization of uh, innovation where you know, I, I think we all know that there's certain companies that are um, either in-house or buying up a lot of the innovation that's happening and this open atmosphere helps us uh, compete on a larger level with them. Um, so speaking of some of those companies, I think we also have to be aware that although many larger companies um, have a lot of rhetoric around supporting and contributing to open, open science and open innovation. Uh, if we look behind the scenes, what we see can sometimes be a little more concerning. Uh, so for example, you know, Facebook had a large uh, PR push around how they were uh, putting tons of things under open source and allowing licenses and allowing people to play with their data. Uh, but if you looked at their uh, custom open source license language that they had crafted and deployed, Basically, what it said was that you know, there, there was an underlying patent license to all, their, uh, all the open source data that they put out, but if you sued Facebook for any reason, that license was pulled. So the effect of the license that they were putting out for PyTorch, which was a pretty fundamental tool that a lot of people were using, made it so that no one could sue Facebook in the future. Uh, luckily, and it was great to see that there was a large outcry against that type of language and that type of control of open science that they were trying, or open innovation that they were trying to exercise, and they backtracked on that. Um, but that won't always be the case, and it's, it especially won't be the case if people aren't aware of the different rights and aren't a little more critical of a uh, certain rhetoric that there is around open innovation. Um, So what does that mean for people who actually um, work and con either contribute or use uh, or exist in open innovation areas? Uh, so I think, you know, as I said, one of the, the biggest uh, effects of open innovation is an explosion in open source software. Uh, so for those of you who aren't in the AI field, you'll know that a lot of the innovation is actually available for anyone to use and play with. Um, most people contribute at least something to, to open source software. A lot of companies who are applying AI to real world problems are actually pulling their uh, original models from open source uh, repos as well. Um, but the way people think about open source software today uh, doesn't necessarily reflect the reality. So, a lot of people see open source as binary, where something is either open source and can be used in any way, or it's not. The reality is that um, just because something is accessible and open source doesn't mean that it can be reused in any way you want. And the flip side of that is that it's possible to contribute to open source communities um, meaningfully and, and really drive innovation that way, but also retain certain rights or certain, uh, certain you know, advantages that you have as competitive advantages uh, in order to build a business around. So there's a whole toolbox of rights that exist um, with, within the software and any systems that you might develop. Unfortunately, unpacking them takes quite a bit more than 10 minutes. Um, you know, there's, there's everything from patents to trade secrets. You can open source the 
architecture of a solution you build without open sourcing the actual code. That code remains protected through trade secrets. That's your competitive advantage. But at the same time, you allow other people to innovate around that architecture, one example among many. Um, and it also allows um, the, the, the choice of open source license or how you use open source software allows you to keep certain rights to yourself. What that means is you could retain your competitive advantages while contributing to open source software. And what it means too is that as a community, um, if we make certain choices, we can keep certain tools in order to keep everyone honest within the, the open, in, open science community. So, you know, there, there are a lot of people, there's a, there's a lot of money involved in the fields that are the most open right now. And unfortunately, that, that gives motivations to certain people to, you know, to, to take advantage of the communities. Um, but, you know, a good example is, let's say, uh, if more people contribute under the MIT licenses, they retain the patent rights uh, to their solutions. Most people who contribute to MIT, uh, you know, who contribute under the MIT uh, licenses don't enforce those patent rights. But if there are, you know, you do have a, if there are bad actors and if as a community we decide that certain people are taking advantage of the way we're acting now, uh, we retain those rights and have the possibility of keeping people in line. Um, and there's a bunch of different ways to do this and obviously we can't go through all of them today, but I think the most important thing is to remain aware of, you know, to, to think more strategically about what licenses you're using, what you're inbounding, and be a little more critical of uh, what some people are saying around op open initiatives and whether or not they're being honest about it. The other area that I want to touch on quickly, I know we're short on time, is um, open databases. So at the moment, um, there are a lot of great databases that are publicly available. Uh, when you're using them, you have to be aware that just because they're publicly available doesn't mean you could use them for any purposes. Uh, there's a big... The, the, the wording used, or the, the licensing used around databases at the moment is quite unclear. Um, we hope that in the future there will be a lot more clarity about what you can and can't do with a, a publicly available database. You know, for instance, the rights could go from using it to benchmark a solution, so you just run a model on it, see the results, and delete that trained model. Everything, you know, ranging to being able to embed representations of that data in your model to have it constantly accessible. And those are two very different things and they affect the, the, the rights, you know, if we're, if we're talking if there's privacy rights involved with that data, they affect uh, the, the people whose data it is in very different ways. And it's a conversation that we're not really having at the moment. Um, I think Element and other, other academic labs are gonna be publishing more and more around this soon and we're gonna make sure that there is a sort of common vocabulary at least used to describe these different rights. Uh, but one thing that the academic community can push is a standardization around um, license rights, around bias in data, things like that. There's a lot of papers that have been published recently about the quality of the data, um, trying to standardize that, but I think that has to extend a little further. Um, and that standardization uh, of both rights and quality will allow more privacy preserving tools that will help us share our data more broadly while being respectful of people's rights because those tools can apply to a bunch of different data sets that have now been standardized and are more easily shareable. Um, so obviously there's a, a lot to impact in all those things. I, I would say that the most important things that I've seen from my time sort of at the forefront of open innovation with large companies involved as well as universities is that um, you have to take a more um, pragmatic approach to what's actually happening on the ground. Uh, we have to make sure to pre you know, protect our SMEs and startups, make sure that they're aware of the rights they're giving up when they uh, use or contribute to open source, um, and um, also push towards standardization and make sure that we're acting as a community uh, to, towards a more open uh, system. Thanks.